at, um, at UQ. Um, I, I, over the years, I've got to spend a bit of time in many campuses all around the world, which I always love. Uh, and this is one of the better ones, both the people who are here and, and the, um, the facility and the, the parklands. It's just, it's wonderful. And um, I'm not working exclusively for the Clay but I've had the great pleasure to have some influence there over the last few years and made many friends. And, and I'm actually into geology again. Uh, I had a wonderful trip, um, almost a, a, a total east-west transit through central western Mongolia <coughs> in the last fortnight, which turned out I wasn't employed to do that, but I ended up doing geology sort of most of the way, which was, was fascinating. Um, anyway, I'm here to lead the session and to talk about, well, uh, Mongolia and Australia, and the theme for my session is, is what can we learn from each other? And, you know, I, I publish, uh, and even, well, I write, and every now and then someone is uh, generous enough to publish. And um, one of the themes I explore is what I call the convergence of comparative advantage. And in the context of this uh, forum, that's what I want to explore. Where can Australia and Mongolia, in particular, work most constructively <coughs> together? And under the general theme, that, uh, that I promote, you look for what you are respectively good at and where those two things come together is where you can make the biggest difference. Um, and I see, you know, in the aid world in general, lots of um, money thrown around that doesn't follow that principle and by and large it just gets frittered away. So my challenge to you uh, and to the other panelists today is, is to think about what can to do that brings the, con the convergence of comparative advantage into place. But before I do that, I just want to reflect and um, get you to think a bit about, well, what is Mongolia and what is Australia like, and where is there the convergence of context? Uh, now, I'm going to start by criticising what's known as the Fraser Institute um, Policy Perception Index, and I don't think David Reardon is here, but he shares my Views. Now it's a little bit unfair because they have actually changed the name of this index to Policy Perception Index. It, it's, you know, it's an encapsulation of the opinions and uh, sentiment of managers and executives from mining companies, thousands of them around the world, on, on what they think the uh, effects of policies in the jurisdictions that they work in are. And as you can see, you know, Mongolia ranks in the lower quartile in, in what's called the current practice perception, and conversely, it ranks in the upper quartile, which I'm not showing here, of the room for improvement perception. Now, although it's just about perceptions, uh, unfortunately, strategists and legal people and those who determine where mining companies will invest their money, they pretty well follow this religiously. And I'm going to argue that this is not a leading indicator of the potential of any nation. And I think it's very uh, incorrect. And it's, it's to the point of being unfair that Mongolia you know, ranks somewhere down there um, along with uh, um, the Ivory Coast and you know, the Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's just ridiculous, right? And I'll, I'll, I hope to convince you of that. So um, what are the, you know, societal, I'm going to speculate on what I would call a societal snapshot of Mongolia uh, and compare that with Australia along the way. And I, although I have training in economics, it's more of the behavioural end, um, and I have what I like to think of as rich experience in sociology. So, you know, I'm looking at the long run societal characteristics of Mongolia rather than the short run um, current policy directions of government or inadequacies of the, of the bureaucracy. So let me just explore some of these things. Um, you know, Mongolia, as we know, is one of the oldest, smallest, you know, natural, proudest nations in the world. It was a nation, you know, long before Europeans crawled out of the bog, as it were. Uh, it all goes back to the Hunu, and no one should ever forget that. You know, that the, the Mongolians approach the world from 
that perspective. Australia, uh, a nation, barely a nation, you know, a, a loose agglomeration of colonies that came together in a federation about 100 years ago, and um, nowhere near that history and longevity that, that uh, Mongolia has. Um, Mongolia is a natural nation, what I would call it. There are not that many in the world, and that, that apart from the Kazakhs on the western um, border, you know, a homogeneous uh, group of people ethnically and linguistically. So there's no tribalism at the vein of Africa. No tribalism other than political tribalism of a, of a recent kind, and we've all got that. Um, Australia, uh, it, it prides itself in its multiculturalism, and very successfully so. So not a lot of similarity there so far. Uh, Mongolia, sparsely populated, uh, vast country, rapidly urbanising, like much of the world is. It, it's, also, it's Asia's outback, really, isn't it? You know? um, so in that sense, really quite similar to Australia. It's a landlocked country, uh, which, according to Jeffrey Sachs, means it's destined to be poor forever. <laughs> I think Brian and I disagree with that totally. We don't buy into the SAC school. Um, Australia, not a landlocked country, in fact it's, it's, it's girt by sea, whatever that is. I've never, you know, that word is an invention, and it's, it's dreadful, you know. Um, I don't think it's even in the dictionary, is it? Girt. What is girt? I presume it means surrounded by sea. Uh, so, not a lot of similarity there. Mongolians have a individualism that is extraordinary. Um, no collectivism. I mean, I guess when you're a herder and it's the middle of the night in December at three o'clock and a blizzard comes up, uh, it's you and your sons and daughters and your wife who are going to save the herd, you know? So there's no great thousands of year experiences of collecting with others to raise the cabbages. So it's just natural that Mongolians have got this extraordinarily sort of European individualistic view of the world. That sounds like Australia to me as well. And I think that's one of the reasons that we all get on so well. In my experience, every Mongolian family is a nation unto itself. Um, with the head of the household expecting to be treated um, with the respect accorded to a, a national leader. Um, that actually sounds like my household, actually. My <laughs> wife is the national leader. Um, you know, so public meetings frequently become a competition about who can display, you know, the greatest personal presence and advocacy, you know, uh, which can be mistaken by, by others as um, just negativity and rampant attacks on, uh, on foreigners. You know, one of the things I've tried to explain to people is that, you know, when you're wrestling with Mongolians, just remember the Mongolians are actually enjoying it, right? <laughs> Um, a robust parliamentary democracy, you know, this constantly shifting coalition of interests and power blocks, you know, it needs to be handled very differently to the, to the Westminster form of, of parliament. Um, way better than dictatorship. A lot of our people are quite uncomfortable with it. I know a lot of Mongolians are uncomfortable with it. They tell me, oh, we need strong leadership. And I go, be careful what you wish for, you know? That actually is democracy at its best, right? And Australia is more and more, you know, emulating it. If you look at our parliamentary um, makeup at the moment, you know, eventually they're going to get Clyde Carmer, I know, and it'll be a sad day for us all. You know, I just want it to go on forever. You know, it's just so entertaining, right? <laughs> a great respect for what I'll call the governmental state. In, uh, in Mongolia, and I think it's a result of the of the socialist period, and, and the Russians did, you know, underwrite and establish a state apparatus, delivered some um, the fundamental modern state services of health clinics and schools and water wells and you know you name it, severely enforced where they deemed it was necessary, and Mongolia had been a feudal society and entered a Soviet form of modernity very, very quickly, and, it, and it's, there's still this vestige of that in the, in the amount of respect that Mongolians give to, give to government. 
not readily apparent in New Zealand, in Australia. I mean, I think there's Australians, there's a presumption that we'll get all that, but that the government bureaucracies are fair game. So not quite the same level of respect. In Mongolia, are a, uh, the residual effects of central planning. Uh, so, you know, very poorly developed subsidiarity in, in government decision making. Local governments are little more than agents for central government services. And I know that, you know, Mongolian policy is to move further into um, direct democracy and cascaded and uh, democracy and subsidiarity, but it's not there. Um, so, and there's a strong sense, I think, that in Mongolia, there's a strong association of sovereignty with government, whereas, you know, in Australia, there's more a sense of government serving sovereignty, if you know what I mean. Um, women, customarily and contemporarily empowered, <coughs> Uh, again, I'm sure reflecting a long history of when, when Genghis and his brothers and sons were out conquering the world, someone had to run the place, didn't they? You know, so it was the women, right? And, uh, and still do, and of course all of those people in the room know, I think it's the only country in the world where the average um, salary of women is higher than the average salary of men as a result of the tragic you know, period in the 90s. Um, so I, I just think that's one of the great underlying um, strengths and themes of Mongolian society is the role that women have. Extremely high levels of uh, literacy and education, uh, courtesy of the socialist era, of course, and still resilient. But I actually think there is that this is Mongolian love of learning um, that, that a socialist education system could not have uh, achieved as much as it did without that. And, and we see it now, the fact that you're all here, you know, and young Mongolians orbiting out into every country in the world, learning, harvesting it all up, and going home. Uh, I mean, that's an extraordinary characteristic. In Australia, we call that the overseas experience, and it's, it's a common characteristic for both of our countries. Um, a very strong, small, well-managed military, uh, proud peacekeeping record, as uh, Ambassador Bob spoke about this morning. No chance whatsoever of a military coup. Uh, in the absence of strong libel laws, totally feral media, print everything and anything they want. Uh, and as I say to people, that's way better than censorship. So, you know, suck it up, play the game, get on with it, right? Uh, healthy climate. Now, Australians go. Joke, right? but, but it is, you know, there's no insect vector communicable diseases. Yes, there are some issues around some serious hepatitis and TB uh, issues and, and Australia can help with that. But by and large, you know, it is not a malaria infested swamp in West Africa, right? Um, it's endowed with a mineral landscape. What do I mean by a mineral landscape? Um, as opposed to sort of mineral endowment. Well, the mineral landscape also has the, it carries with it the connotation that there isn't a strong competing other economic presence. Now, notwithstanding herders and cattle and goats and sheep and you know, all that good stuff, but it's not like you're gonna get the arguments here in Australia between what I believe is called you know, strategic farming versus uh, mining. So, Yes, a magnificent mineral endowment, as yet almost totally undiscovered, but at the same time, not vast areas of uh, rivers and, and lakes and competing economic interests in urban, urban areas. So it's uniquely it's like, you know, the gold fields in Western Australia. It's almost as if it was supposed to be a mining uh, economy. Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute that that gives anyone the right to go and, you know, rape the village and turn the whole thing into a, into a great big quarry. You know, it's got to be done sensibly. Um, an arid, open uh, grassland and desert. Uh, the mystique, you know, it, I've seen many deserts in the world and there's nothing particularly special about the Mongolian one. I have to tell you, in the last I'm sorry to say that to Mongolia, but then say to Mongolia. But there is a mystique. You know, the mystique of the Gobi and the mystique of the Mongolians 
and the and the, the mystique of long song. I mean, I, you know, but I I somehow or other have developed a great affinity for long song. When I hear long song, I think the Gobi, and I know that's what it's all about. The great horizons that go on forever, and um, so that sounds a little bit like Australia as well, right? The great outback. We are commonly people of the great open savanna and grasslands and deserts. Now, uh, I just want to make a few comments about, um, this is where I'm going to get academic for about three minutes. If, if you haven't read Fukuyama's book, The Origins of Political Order, you should. And his more recent book, Political Order and Political Decay, which just came out two weeks ago or three weeks ago. One follows the other. The first is the history of how humans developed political stability from chimpanzees through the French Revolution. The second is the French Revolution to now. And Fukuyama perhaps points out the obvious, but he does it extremely eloquently, that there are three elements to accountable government, or three elements to a stable political order. One is accountable government. Are, are people elected? Is there the ability to regularly remove, peacefully, political incumbents. Um, in Mongolia's case, yes, there is. And I give them 100%. In fact, it's not even that I have to give Mongolia 100% for democracy. The, the international scrutineers um, who came and witnessed the presidential election um, did exactly that. So the process of election is open and accountable. That doesn't mean to say you don't get a lot of rat bags in there who haven't sort of bought their way in with cases of vodka or something else, but that happens anywhere. And there's a way to sort that out, and all the young Mongolians in this room are part of that. So nevertheless, accountable government, 100%. A functional state, you know, are there departments in place that have regulation accountabilities that deliver social services. Does everyone understand you know, what that is? Does it do it rather well? Uh, and I think Mongolia probably gets about 60% for that. There is a skeletal functional state. Um, everyone knows which department is supposed to deliver what. Uh, there's a bit of um, funny business at the heads of departments at a political level during after an election change. But otherwise, you know, it's, it's pretty well there, right? The, the, the people are confident. Resourcing would improve a lot, but the foundations and the skeleton are all there. Now, the rule and the certainty of law, um, and which are different, by the way. Uh, could I expect the same outcome in a legal decision in Sulkbata IMAG from the one that I would get in uh, the Probably not, right? And it's not due to corruption or payoffs or anything like that. It's just due to this sort of mishmash of imported continental war influences that make up the Mongolian legal framework. Uh, bits from Russia and Germany and Turkey and Korea and even, but even from Australia. Um, and at times these pieces are capriciously understood and applied. So, you know, I would give Mongolia about 30% on the certainty of law because no one really knows how a legal outcome should fall down. And that, I believe, is why the other two don't function as good as they could. Anyway, it's only my opinion. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done around the rule and certainty of law in Mongolia, and I see a lot of other people hyperventilating about a lot of other things, you know? So, convergence of context. You know, what can we actually learn from each other? Um, and I believe that you know any real assistance from Australia uh, should be based on this comparative advantage that I talked about before, and you know rather than us as Australians or Mongolians attempting to compete with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and other things. So some of those things are uh, you know true capacity building for um, IMAG and SUM administrations in real functional things, you know like budget processes, town planning governance and, and management, human resource development, you know, really at the at the coalface. That could be done through sister city relationships uh, with the Australian Local Government Association. Um, you know, fiscal management is something that local governments struggle with all over the world, right? So we don't have to get too high level about this. Just one of the very, very functional things that could be done. 
Uh, so this is Humboldt's on the centre. Um, the roads have gone in this in the last year. Um, electrification has gone in, and already uh, people are avoiding paying their power bills. Uh, of course, you know, and very simple ways need to be explored. Some of you who, who grew up in the UK, probably your parents, not you, you know, you used to have to put a coin in the meter box, right? To, you know, you had to pay for the power before you got it. So whatever the modern equivalent is through, you know, mobile phones, you know, putting in place a retail power system that requires you to top it up before you get it is a neat way of actually um, preventing people just not paying for their power. You know, you know, simple things like that, right? Whereas others, you know, all want to go off and build giant policy edifices and it's simple little things like that which would, would greatly help. Um, some of the other things, uh, let me go back to the list, pre-competitive uh, geoscience data and uh, acquisition, and I know we're already doing that, data management and acquisition, Australia's doing that, the best in the world. Mining tenure regulation and management systems, same, again, what, you know, some of the best in the world. Real property registration and management systems, Torrance title, you know, which became, as an accident of history, was very easy to establish in Australia, but it's now been picked up by Russia and all sorts of other places because of its simplicity <coughs> and, its, and its guarantee. The, um, the funding and resourcing of groundwater basin exploration and management, um, and I know that there's already an exchange program going with young Australian volunteers in the, in the fledgling um, river basin authorities which have just been established in the last year, which are actually groundwater based on the forest, really, when it's all set up. And, and I met one of them, Nick, Nick Quigley, I think, you know, just absolutely fantastic young Australian. Uh, met him in the Gobi. There's no way he's hanging around UB. He, he's gone down and he's living in Darwin's own yard and he's out across the Gobi every day, right? And that's, that, that's the sort of aid, and, and that's what young Australians like to do. And uh, so that's why I think they can be particularly useful. Um, regional health services. You know, based on the Australian model of mobility with aeromedical or RFDS type models. Right? So instead of trying to maintain a fully staffed and um, equipped health clinic in every swim centre, having basic triage stabilisation and moving patients to a bigger centre where they can be treated. And I rush to add, um, not flying, right? It's 10 years away before Mongolia even have a flying medical service. But even in Australia, the RFDS does most of its extraction and emergency work and preventative work on ground-based vehicles. And I recently, two weeks ago, I had the great pleasure to, to take and, and accompany two Flying doctor, doctors from WA through the entire Ongobi, uh, on, and we met with all sorts of people from the policy level in UB right through to uh, herders, and, and it was wonderful to have that kind of you know deep insight from practitioners into what could truly work, you know, right down to well we think that the RFDS medical kits here would work quite simply, you know, uh, and I won't go into what they all mean, but real grounded participation observation um, and I get to do fun things like that quite a bit. Uh, technical trades training of course and Australia is doing this in the T people centre as you know. I think the real strength of Australians is, is that learning by doing, you know, uh, which has been a bit different to the model that Mongolia had before, the old intelligentsia model, you know, where you're reading about it but but you're not expected to be hands on, you know. Quite the opposite. In Australia, trades training, you, you it's hands on. You, you, you have to go look like a herder, you know. There's, you can't read how to crutch a sheep or or slaughter a goat, you know, from a book, right? You have to actually do it. So I think the strength in Australian trades training is learning by doing, and an insistence upon that. Um, Surely there's great scope for exchange around rural veterinary uh, programs. And Mongolia did have a terrific rural veterinary program uh, um, until it all kind of 
went backwards in the 90s when resources ran dry. Uh, but this is an area of surely of, of great exchange because of that common culture around the pastoral sector. And I just know there'd be lots of young Australian vets who would love to have six months, you know, working at Barg and some level in, in Australia, in, uh, in Mongolia. And this is the moment we've all been waiting for. <laughs> I'm going to tell it in the form of a story because it goes right to the heart of how you get things done. I'm driving across the Gobi there nearly two years ago, and my driver, Hush, says through my young economist translator, well, I sheep you've got in Australia is how do you get the wool off? You know, I'm like, well, it's machines, I can share them going. Do you reckon that would work on camels? <coughs> well, I can't see why it wouldn't, but you know, how do you get it off at the moment? Oh, we, we use scissors. And I mean, the guy that would have lost the translation there, what they mean is, you know, finely honed, razor sharp, hand shears, which would, you know, no, no, <laughs> scissors, you know, blunt kitchen scissors. Oh, you know, so we, right, tell me more. Race back, find a computer, load up YouTube, shearing sheep. Hush his eyes and he popped out of his head. Shearing camels, nothing. <laughs> of course. So we go, oh, well, well, oh, hang on, let me see. Alpacas. It's a small camel. Shearing alpacas. So we, anyway, to cut a long story short, then I went out and witnessed this excruciating um, business of shearing camels with the tie back and the, and, and the hole. I thought, mate, there's a bit of scope here for improvement. And uh, Hush sort of tells me, I have a dream. My dream is that my brothers and I will become shearing contractors. Because the old people are getting too old, the average age of herders is giving up, and half the camels are not being shorn anymore, so they lose their wool all over the desert every year, and there's no classing and valuing and splitting into high quality, low quality. And if no one here has a camel, a baby camel wool coat, please get one. They are the most beautiful things, right? Um, baby camel wool has got the same micron fineness as cash wool, like total. So, uh, uh, getting through to May last year, I smuggled back into the country. I didn't really smuggle. Surely I'm allowed to take a couple of electric shearing machines. And, and, and we got a DVD and Hush and I taught each other to, we taught ourselves how to shear, right? <laughs> and I had to have a bit of help and instruction from the shearing school in Western Victoria. And we went out and we shore one of Hush's camels. And it was amazing. Um, and Hush went on to shear the rest, but it all got a bit difficult because maintenance was a problem. I bought real high quality Swiss kind of gear. Others have tried this Chinese rubbish in one last two seconds. And we, we didn't have a sharp and we didn't, you know, so it, it didn't, anyway, it, it, we proved it could work. This year I took Roger Lipsley, champion shearer from Hamilton, Western Victoria, and we, we demonstrated, and we called it that, because you know, the herders said, well, just give us the shears, we'll get on with them. Hang on, hang on, hang on. So I had five sets of shearing gear, plus the, the sharpener, which is that wheel that you can see there. And we've got shearing a camel down to 20 minutes. You know, and a big male camel normally takes two hours. The improvements that can come now are differentiation, classing, valuing, auction, and <coughs> cleaning. Um, the tie-down method is, is a Total breakthrough. I'm going over time, I'm sorry, so I'll kind of wrap it up. And um, then to keep the momentum going, I bought Harsh and some of his, uh, some other herders to Western Victoria two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And they went to shearing school, and they're now the only Mongolians in the world that are certified, it's certificate two in camel shearing, wool handling, and classing. And they've just gone back to Mongolia, right? <laughs> and I hope that the president is there to meet them at the airport because they deserve it. I mean, Quite, quite extraordinary, right? This has cost nothing, right? We've just done this as a private initiative. But this is what I'm talking about. It's wonderful convergences, you know, the world's best camels with the world's best wool handling technology. It's a no-brainer. So we've got to think about where we're going with that next year. Now, in the meantime, just to emphasize Ambassador Bowles, I think wonderful. Uh, summary of where the real advances have been made, people to people, people to people. So 
this cultural exchange. Um, first side of the ocean, uh, two of them swam, one of them didn't. I won't tell to say which one. <laughs> Australian surfers just blown away, oh, I'll show you how to surf. It didn't happen, but anyway, they got your photographs taken. First sign of merino sheep, and you know, my god, they really are the size of camels, aren't they? The merino sheep, they're not quite, you know. And, and then, of course, these wonderful camels. Now, of course, the, the foreigner, the expat, has to ride the white one, doesn't he? You know, and I've always been amused by how come you haven't got more white ones? And white ones are, oh, well, you know, they look like sheep, you know, they're not really, they're not real camels. You know? Well, why do you keep them? Oh, well, 5% in the herd makes the brown ones look better, you know. <laughs> so, um, just this, this, this exchange of like minded views and affection. Um, that's possible between Mongolians and Australians, and I urge everyone to keep that up, and I challenge my fellow panel members to explore more <coughs> of these convergences. Thank you.